Okay. Shh. All right. Uh, as a quick, polite reminder to everyone here, uh, if you are taking photos, which you're more than welcome to do, make sure that you have the consent of everyone in the frame. That means everyone. So if I took a photo up here right now, I'd have to talk to each and every one of you beforehand and say, is it all right to take a photo? All right. With that, uh, without any further ado, this is LTE versus Darwin by Hendrik and Brian. So please. OK, thanks. Hello. And welcome to our talk. So my name is Hendrik, and this is Brian. Um, we are both security researchers from Germany. Um, we are dealing with um, telecommunication networks, so for example, 4G LTE networks. And this is a talk about um, our um, current research. So we analyzed the 4G LTE network in back end and front end and um, are searching for security problems. Um, this is, uh, yeah, should be the first talk of um, some more, and um, we will see um, how it gets. So, um, some background about us. Um, we are old school network geeks, um, dealing with a lot of technology. Um, we are working for the company called ENW in Germany, based in Heidelberg. And um, yes, um, we make security assessments, and if you want to make security assessments in deep, you have to understand the technology in deep. So we we'll take a look at each technology, and then we look at um, security problems. Um, we are always talking about um, some topics, uh, security topics, and on our blog. So it's um, shown here on the slide. Um, for example, insinuators. So if you are interested in talk with us, may, um, have a discussion with, uh, with us. Um, also on the conference, or for example, who wants a deeper look inside, um, we are involved in a in security, in a telco research project, um, which has ended last year, um, called Asmonia. Okay, so back to our talk. Um, why 4G LTA? Because it's a very interesting and new and very um, complex technology. It's a new one. And it, it, it introduces a lot of very interesting features. For example, self-organizing networks. A security guy, if you hear uh, self-organizing networks, so you're thinking about them, um, is it really working? So we take a look at it, and we are talking about trust, especially, and optional controls mentioned in some specs. So yeah, enjoy the talk. First of all, we thought um, each talk should have information, and second, uh, some kind of message, and because of this, we have a comparison with Darwin. Um, Brian will explain you. Okay, yeah, so um, talking about evolution, I guess for most of you, Darwin, Darwin might be a proper enemy for long-term evolution. Um, main aspect we're actually looking at, whether we're leaving in Darwin or not, doesn't make a difference for us. Natural selection actually has a few, say, base structs, which we think are quite important. In this case, it is taking oneself out of the gene pool. Um, stupid things, especially in technology, shouldn't happen more than once. So somebody's hacked, you've got the, um, the bug, the, whatever the vulnerability that was used, it should be fixed. So second try, it shouldn't happen again. The Darwin Award itself actually originated from a use, um, use, Usenet group from around about 1985 and has been yeah, developed further on since. Simple things, stupid things, a nice guy who actually tried to have some fun with firecrackers in his butt and kind of blowing his balls off. Now the thing is you always hear these news and they could be fake. And most people think they're fake, and most people actually say hope that they're fake. Problem actually then is um, quite often they aren't. And I don't know which one of you would actually try it. Uh, not really the best thing to do. So for us, quite simply, the question is, is Darwin, is natural selection the one enemy to take down long-term evolution? Okay, back to the technology. Uh, we'll start with some basics. Um, who of you knows the setup of a 4G LTE network? Uh, not much, I thought. Okay, so uh, we start with some basics, so everybody tries to understand. 
Um, for GLTE, first is specified by the 3GPP, the third generation partnership and project, um, and it really deals in, with LTE and um, HSDPA, for example, UMTS networks. But it's already starting with GSM. Um, another important um, specification group um, is the ITU, or in Europe, and the ETSI. Um, we are focusing on the specification on 4G LTE, um, and this is only done by 3GPP. Um, here are the um, 3GPP milestones listed. It um, starts in 1999. So here we see um, CDMA specifications, HSDPA up to LTE and LTE advanced. So we are talking about LTE, but LTE advanced is based on it. So um, and. LTE was uh, uh, finished about 2012, but it's still in progress. So there are always changes to the specifications, um, so it's always a bit tricky to find something there. Um, and LTE and further LTE um, research is going on there um, up to 1000, uh, 2016 is the plan at the moment. So the basic architecture. Um, the most important thing is that 4G is based on an IP packet system. So the old network, GSM, UMTS, for example, is based on a um, circuit switch network, and 4G LTE has IP communication. So for all of us, it's uh, quite better to understand. Um, we have on the left side, you see on the slide, um, the LTE yeah, um, wireless network, for example, or under non-3GP networks. Non-3GP networks means some kind of non, uh, untrusted networks connected to the core system. Um, so, um, for example, Wi-Fi clients on a hotspot, hotspot or something like that. Um, then we have the packet core domain. This is the core system of the LTE network. And this system is connected to outside networks, other IP networks, for example, internet. Um, here in more detail, uh, you don't have to understand everything in detail now, but um, you see there, is, there are a lot of components, and these are not all components um, specified by the VGPP. It's very, very complex. Um, but you have the terminals, so the UE, called UE, user equipment. This is connected to the access networks. It's a radio access network, so the um, wireless network, for example. Um, and this network, has a base station, um, the antenna, for example, um, and it's routing the packets to the core network. The core network is the, the, the heart of the provider. So there are all the management functionalities and booting functionalities and services provided to the customer. Um, for example, um, the MME here in the middle, um, it's a management entity. This is really the control function server for the whole environment. Then the SAE gateway, in the middle of the right of the MME. Um, it's parted into the serving gateway and PDN gateway, packet data network gateway, uh, which is a, has a core routing function. And in here all the um, calls are terminating and then route, uh, routed to other IP networks, for example. And then there are a lot of more functions uh, like charging systems, the database HSS, it's uh, equivalent to the GSM and UMTS network. So you see there are, is really a bunch of components. Um, another important um, point is that um, calls are, uh, that for calls, voice over IP is used. This is placed in the IMS, intermediate subsystem. And um, the PCRF um, has policies who is able to do something in the network. So these are the basics, just uh, a little bit of them. Um, now we come to the real, to, to the important stuff. Okay, um, LTE in the field. Now, first question is what do you actually see out in the field? The only things that you can really see are antennas and the E node Bs. The E node B is the actual air interface. It's the bit that's got a network cable on the one side and the antenna on the other side. They come in quite few different shapes and sizes, meaning you've got quite small boxes, say the size of a laptop, just a bit thicker, somewhere up on a cell mast. You've got ginormous 19-inch racks, what you've got for every server system. 
or you've sometimes even really got portable e-note bees. During our research, we actually found a few approaches to, say, an e-note bee that could be carried for tactical reason in a backpack for somebody out in the field and kind of carrying its own LTE network wherever around with them. There are mainly, yeah, four different types or four different sizes of cells that are established by these e bees. The macro cells are the, I guess, normal cells that you'd have in every town with a radius of more than 100 meters. Then you've got the micro cells, which go up to 100 meters, which could be, say, if you've got a block of houses that has to be covered. Then you've got the pico cells with 20 to 50 meters, which are mainly intended for, say, company use, office use. So, own company, you haven't really got a very good cell phone reception, so you place a mast somewhere. And then, of course, you've got the home e note bees, which are, let's say, femto cells. The same principle. Um, the most important thing about an e note bee, if you think about it, it's somewhere out in the field. I guess a few of you have seen cell masts and seen the um, security measures around them, probably guard dogs and whatever. That's the one point where all encryption coming from the UE terminates and on the other side where all the encryption from the backend terminates. So say you've got access to an e-note B, everybody using it, it's, it's yours. Now, um, having all these different sizes of cells results in heterogeneous networks. You've got Above the normal LTE cells, you've got systems like um, WiMAX and Wi-Fi, and they actually come up in the specifications. So there are concepts that people can actually roam from an LTE network over into a WiMAX network or into a normal Wi-Fi wi network, which of course is quite a complex situation. And for that reason, you've got the functionality of self-organizing and self-configuring networks which we'll have a look at later on. Just as an example, a small e-note B, as you can really find them outside. Um, an e-note B has got ports for multiple antennas. Simple reason on the one hand, LTE is a multiple input, multiple output system. So increasing throughput at, by using multiple antennas. Above that, an e-note B is able to establish multiple phone cells. Using directional antennas, you can actually go around the cell mass in certain areas, and depending on which side you're on, you've really got a different cell. Which means, of course, in areas where um, two cells would collide, you put a cell mass in between, and you optimize coverage. The e bees themselves are placed yeah, close to the antennas. Smaller devices can sometimes really be placed up on the cell mast. Larger devices, of course, on the ground as I said before, connected via LAN, um, self-configuring, you've got stuff like DHCP running and giving an e-note be an IP address. Interesting solution. Now, what we had a quite a good look at are, yeah, UEs. Question, what do we have? We've got phones. Of course, phones are there to do phone calls. We had said it's an IP-based system, so you've got voice over IP. SMS are turned into zip messages, just the way it goes. And above that, of course, you've got normal tablets and slates, you've got your USB sticks and USB modems, 4G cards, mobile hotspots, and funnily enough, even an active relay node in an LTE network will at some moment play simple, a simple UE, but we'll have a close look at that later. Um, our scope, yeah. Usually if you look at mobile devices, you look at the software, you might have a look at hardware attacks, and you probably have a look at apps installed. We, on the other hand, are actually trying to have a look at the equipment from the outside. Say, what can we find out about, an, um, about a mobile phone without having it in our hands? And on the end, thinking about what does the mobile phone actually know about the network? Typical data is the physical cell ID, the tracking area codes, normal signal strength measurements, and its own position. The cell ID, or physical cell ID, is roundabout similar to the normal cell IDs you know from GSM networks. 
a normal identifier to know where you are and for the back end to know where a mobile phone is. In LTE, there are 504 different IDs. So of course, if you think about a large country, you'll have far more cells than only 504. The system there is by using um, automated neighbor relations between E node Bs. It's only important that you haven't got the same cell IDs in adjacent cells. So you go further out, cell IDs can simply repeat. Above that, nowadays in LTE, you've got tracking areas. Now, thinking about GSM, paging. A phone call comes in for a mobile phone, which is usually in standby mode, and it has to be woken up. Paging messages sent out, they used to go to a cell. Nowadays, they go to a tracking area. And if you think about it, that a tracking area can contain multiple cells, it is actually quite interesting to try to work out how large is the tracking area. How far do I have to be away from a mobile phone to maybe work out that he's actually being called at the moment? Then you've got the signal strength. Um, not a lot to be said about that. I guess you really know how good the, the bars you've got on your mobile phones are. Mainly just fun. Then you've got location. Um, of course, the mobile phone can get its own location using systems like GPS, Galileo, or GLONASS. But above that, you can use cell net-based positioning. For these approaches, there's the enhanced serving mobile location center somewhere in the back end, which simply is a system that will help a piece of equipment to find out its own position. The equipment can send out a request, and then the ESMLC will do the rest. Positioning itself is then done by um, observed time difference of arrival. So your mobile phone will get a list of certain E-Note Bs that are around you. And they'll wait for certain messages and will just measure the time difference in between. And by that, a normal triangulation is possible again. Then we've got the question, accessing data. Okay, if you've got your mobile phone, there are various ways to really access the data that you'd like to have. On iOS systems, you've got the very magic number that I'm not going to read out now. Giving out various information on um, the cell ID, the tracking area, yes, on the second one, and just the stuff that we want to have a look at. On Android, you've got some extra apps. I've just got an example here. And then the big question, as I said, why do we actually want this data? Um, I guess all of you know that it's quite important to know how stuff works. I guess that told you if you would have known that it kind of has got some recoil. Nah. For us with technology, it's you've got to do your homework before you can do any kind of security assessment. And of course, 3GPP has published stacks of documentation, stacks of white papers and stuff, but White papers really never show what's in the field, so it's up to us to just have a look at it. Our simple approach at the moment is to write a small app for Android devices. I know there are a few out on the market, but we just want a minimalistic system, get all the cell mass information that it's got, get the current position, stick it all into an XML file, do some good old classic war driving. Um, you can do it simply on an Android app, or you can do it manually using some kind of 4G modem or a mobile phone using AT commands. You've got this good old AT plus COPS question mark, which will give you information on all um, networks that a single cell can see at the moment, or that a single, single mobile device can see at the moment. So that's one of the parts of research that we're currently working on. Just sit in our cars, have a look around. When we've done, or when the app is finished and we've got some data, we'll publish in our blog. Whoever is interested can have a look at it, and of course, whoever wants to know what kind of LTE systems is around them, give it a try and just see. Now we've got the question, third-party awareness. What can somebody else in a mobile phone network actually see about my phone, or what data can he get? LTE is an IP network, so of course scanning is possible. We'll have a look at that a little bit later on. 
course, there are some sorts of access control lists out in the field which work perfectly. And this point, sorry, we're going to have a look at some exemplary data, which is the attach procedure, meaning the initial bearer setup. Involved components, of course, the whole backend is involved, um, the enode B, and of course the user equipment. Now I've got the very simple scenario, some mobile phone is switched on. It'll contact the enode B, send out the ROC connection request, and at that stage will include some kind of, um, yeah, STMZ, a mobile um, a temporary IMSI number, or in some situations simply a random row of digits. Data is transferred over to enode B, initial connection is set up, and then, just as we're used to from GSM systems, the mobile phone sends out its IMSI, its IMSI number. So at this point, we'd still be able to use some sort of LTE IMSI catcher to get this little number. Above that, data is sent on from the enode B back into the back end to the MME. Just to think about it, um, Communication relayed from the enode B to the MME, which is NAS messages, is always encrypted. That's the way that it has to be. Every packet needs an encryption header. Um, problem just is, nah, the algorithms that they've got on offer, you know, it's, it's, it has to be encrypted, so why well, give the option? Um, after that, of course, the MME in the back end fetches all necessary um, keys for the mobile phone, fetches the prescriber data, passes it back, passes it back onto the front. The not be establishes the actual connection. And from that moment on, all data transmitted is actually encrypted. Meaning, still we can reach the IMSI number, but that's about it. And especially going up the next level, it's an IP network, so there isn't really a lot that you can catch over the air if it's done properly. If it is, the future will have to show. Yeah, then we've got the paging process. Um, paging process in GSM systems is quite interesting. I think um, Attack was published last year simply using um, hacked mobile phones answering all paging requests. Kind of the network says, hey, um, where's mobile phone ABC? And some other mobile phone says, hey, it's me. And these mobile phones actually did that for all possible phones around them. Breaking stuff. So the question is, how is paging actually here with us in LTE? It is slightly similar, of course. The UE is in some kind of standby mode and gets data sent to it. The UE wakes up from time to time periodi periodically, gets the stuff, and good. Problem just is, you haven't really got this, um, hey phone, ABC, is a message for you anymore. You've got a frame, and somewhere in this frame, there's a little, to do it simpler, we'll call it a flag saying, hey, there's a message for you in that point. So all mobile phones will get or can get the same um, paging frames, but they'll only react to the data re that's really for them. And of course, the, data to, or the frame to react to is slightly obfuscated. I've got to say I love all slides just with a formula on it, so I just had to do it. Um, finding the frame. You've got a system frame number on every frame that goes out. You've got um, a DRX cycle of the UE, which is actually the interval in system frames in which the UE wakes up and checks for paging messages. Then you've got the number of paging occasions per DRX, which is a setting in the enode B. You've got N, yeah, the um, minimum of the DRX cycles and the number of paging occasions. And you've got the so-called UE, the UEID, which is IMSI mod 1024. So by this point, you'll have a slight problem identifying any kind of mobile phone on the network. It's not the IMSI number that's used anymore, it's the IMSI number mod 1024. So actually reversing that to a 15-digit or breaking it down to a 10-digit IMSI number 
not really very easy to do anymore. Above that, you've got the paging occasion, meaning you've got the whole frame. This frame has got subframes, and the UE has to identify its actual subframe that it's got to look at. For that, you've got the next function, um, looking at the whole frame and then finding positions. These subframes are, say, nine ele uh, ten elements long, and you see it in the little table on there, which is actually from the specs, that only in position zero, four, five, and nine, you can have a paging occasion that you can react to. Now, doing a little bit of maths, playing around with it, you will work out that there is a maximum of um, 8,160 paging locations. So, of course, you'd think, hey, that makes it easy for me to find a mobile phone. But yet again, as soon as a mobile phone roams, goes into a different DNOB cell, um, the constant are, constants are different, so the whole terms change. So yet again, you can't track a device. Above that, playing around with the numbers a little bit further, you've got four possible paging locations. Ends up that you can actually only have um, 32,640 different paging codes in one single cell which means if you'd have another mobile phone extra in that cell, two phones would actually be paged by the same message. But even then, who cares? Um, what's the impact? You lose a little bit of extra battery power. But above that, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. And at this point, we're going to jump back to the backend structure. Yeah. Let's take a look at, um, to the other side, the backend structure. So the E not B and um, the components behind. You m remember the structure, um, here we have um, one or more E not Bs um, connected to each other and the backend of the provider. Um, all these components are talking to each other by a so-called control plane. The control plane um, means the plane where all the management traffic is um, going over. Um, then the other part is a user plane, there all the user traffic is going over. Um, and this traffic both should be protected by IPsec. All the, tra um, all the um, security in 4G for transmission protection is based on IPsec. And we all need know how good this is working, but uh, we will see. Um, some quotes from the specification um, about end, end, um, endpoint security. Um, all e -Node Bs, for example, shall be authenticated and authorized. So the attackers shall not be able to modify the e -Node B settings. Sounds good, I would say. Um, shall be authenticated and authorized. But, but what does it mean? Um, we as attackers want to have access to the devices. So, okay, there is an authentication, um, so we need a better access. Um, how we get access? For example, um, this is a, a common security structure um, of an e not b um, standing somewhere in the forest, I would say. Um, you see the security me mechanisms there. Yeah? Ju just jump over, um, open the door, and you have access. And you have access to, to an IP network. So somewhere there, um, Ether an Ethernet switch is standing, um, and you can plug in and see the traffic. OK, there was one point. Um, it's IPsec encrypted. Um, so. Let's take a look about the certificates uh, and the certificate chain. Um, how is it going? Um, how an e not b gets his um, public and private key pair? Um, usually, um, the key pair is created locally, so on the e not b itself. So it's okay, and it should never reach outside. outside. So um, it never uh, um, leaves the platform. Um, then it is signed. By, uh, the public key is signed by the factory certification of the vendor, and this um, certific and certificate, the factory certificate, got to the customer in a secure way, whatever this means. Um, on this secure way, it comes to the customer, so the operator, and the operator stores the key as a high-level certificate in its key store. Yes. Um, for a hacker, for an attacker, what does it mean? This means, on this point, if he gets the certificate, he has a certificate near to the root. Sounds nice. So, um, but whatever, that's just a bit discussion to them. Um, 
it doesn't really matter. Why? Because in the specifications, they were standing that uh, IPsec uh, must be used, so it's required to um, implement IPsec, but only in tunneling mode. And transport mode is better, but um, it's uh, set to optional. Um, so in most cases, there will be some security gateways in front of the E0Bs, and if you get um, between the E0B and the security gateway, you have unencrypted traffic. Okay, nice. Um, some more notes about that. Um, again, some notes out of the uh, specification. Um, if the control plane or the user plane are trusted, and we know the trusted environment, here it, it is, um, there is no need to use protection. That's how it's um, standing in the specification. And, uh, and better is a note um, just um, on the down. Um, in case S1 and X2 um, user plane interfaces are trusted, e.g. physically protected, um, protection is not needed. So this is a physically protection. Um, so some more words about security for the endpoints. Um, it's a really, really complex environment. So DHCP is used, there are a lot of certificates, auto-connection mechanisms are implemented, and auto-configuration mechanisms. So um, there are a lot of servers always communicating with the E-Node-Bs. Um, and this is very, very complex, and where complexity is, there are often implementation failures. So feel free um, to try it or something. Um, Furthermore, there are always management interfaces and common IP network problems and vulnerabilities. Here, for example, we've done some, uh, some scans, some reachability scans. Um, and the upper picture um, shows that the uh, host is down, and the um, picture on the, on the um, bottom um, shows a scan from inside of the provider's network. So you see that there is a difference if you are in the internet or if you are inside of the um, provider's network. Inside means you are connected via UMTS or LTE. In this case, it's LTE. Um, so on the bottom picture, you see the, the, here is a host, a host of the provider, so some servers inside of the network um, with which you can communicate. Um, and then you have access to the, um, the yeah, to the target, and yes, um, we know it now, some vulnerabilities. Um, there is some kind of vulnerability testing um, necessary, and you can explore some vulnerability, for example. Um, yeah, but it's illegal, sure. Um, here is an example. Um, you see an ATP CLI. This is a Huawei BTS system we found. Um, yes, we still not open. Um, nice, I would say, in an LTE network, whatever. Why ever? And there is a problem, I would say. And why is it so? Um, APNs, and if somebody has heard of APNs, so APNs um, stand for access point names. Access point names is, uh, is the gateway you are using it. And it, depending on the gateway you are using it, you have another access list. So the firewall rule set is a different one, for example. Um, and APNs usually are well known. So you get an APN from the provider you are putting into your phone, into your configuration, and then you have a gateway. Um, but there are always some more gateways. For example, there are um, hidden emergency call gateways you are, can use uh, with an anonymous SIM or without a SIM, and you can do some phone calls. Um, and some, we have often some debugging um, APNs, uh, for example, or something like that. Uh, and these APNs have a different and mostly open access list. Um, and if you find the APN name, you are on another point in, in the network. Um, here, for example, um, is a tool um, from NW called APNBF. Um, you can download it in CodeCafe. Um, this is a brute forcer for APN brute forcing. So you can brute force and, uh, and try to find um, such systems. Um, okay. Um, to do something against it, there is a specification from CVGPP. 
but um, it's from the year 2013, so it's really, really new. Um, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a shame that it um, comes up um, in 2013, but, and, and not earlier, but um, now is it there, there, so okay. And this specification um, shows up, um, recommends um, security and security assurance methodology. For example, um, lifecycle management process, um, security compliance testing, basic vulnerability testing, and enhanced vulnerability analysis. So they are on the right way, I would say. But uh, it's not, it's the theory, and we will see how it's in, the, in, in practice in the next years. Um, back to the S1 interface. Um, the S1 interface is the main control interfa interface be between the base station, so the E0B, and the management entities. Um, it's based on, and there a new protocol is developed called S1 AP. S1 AP stands for S1 application protocol. It, uh, therefore, to deliver the, the content, um, the co management traffic, SCTP destination port um, 36412 is used. Um, but what can attackers not do? So, if an attacker gets access to the E0B, he can try to speak S1 IP. Um, on this point, um, on this point, we developed some scripts we, uh, we wanted to show you. Um, with this script, it is possible to fake S1 IP messages. I hope you will see the demo. Yeah, it's coming up. So, um, here I have a, um, a CTP listener um, running uh, locally, and um, I use a, a tool called Dizzy. Dizzy is a protocol fuzzer, um, but it's um, always um, possible to send um, single messages and that's to spoof messages. Um, so, I have Wireshark opened to de demonstrate it. And now I will start it. And now you see that I have sent an S1 IP message. This, for example, here you see it, um, has all the items included we need. Um, it talks to the, uh, to the E node B from the MME um, that the E node B should release a specific uh, radio access beaver. So a call will be dropped or a user will be dropped from its session. And so sending these messages can inter interrupt or disrupt and the E-not be in his work. Um, or on the other side, you can um, um, speak with the MME and uh, yeah, do that, uh, some kind of stuff. Um, so we developed some scripts to test it, um, to play around with it. There are a lot of nice messages, for example, we wrote. Um, you can initiate uh, some handovers if you like to. So you say the inert B, hey, give me uh, a session, a call of somebody, um, and hand it over to some other inert B. So an inert B of an attacker, for example. So there were really a lot of them. Um, the scripts, yeah, I will publish them um, after the con um, on our blog. Who's interested in? Um, you can uh, really do a lot of them. Um, on the premise um, that you have an e B or an MME, for example. Furthermore, it's possible to do some kind of implementation testing with this tool. So now it's looking like this. Like this. We are sending a lot of different um, S1 IP messages and, uh, yeah, Feel free to um, look how the e B is reacting. Okay. Back to the slides. So what does it mean? Um, in this case, it means that you have to understand how technology really works. 
So the providers should do some kind of implementation testing, find out how their stuff works and how they develop it. Otherwise, this may ha happen. <laughs> and I think that's not good. Okay, now to the next aspect, self-organizing networks. I've got to admit, um, that's actually the first thing that I got in contact with when talking about LTE. And I've got to say, I just love the principle. Um, there are two things about it. You've got the self-configuration aspect, which is big style plug and play. Big style as in cell phone masks that do plug and play on the cell phone network. Um, the why, yeah, cost. Just think about it. You've got some technician going out with a normal GSM cell mast. He's got to put up the mast, he's got to put up the antenna, he's got to attach the BTS. He's got to blooming configure it somewhere out in the field and he's got to put configuration data in. Which means you've got some high skilled technician somewhere out in the woods doing the same job every day. And that's actually quite expensive. So what do you want? You want a little black box, you attach an antenna, you attach a LAN cable, you connect power and the whole thing is up and running. Um, truly, sounds great. Um, an eNode B itself is kind of pre-configured. It comes from a factory, we've already said so, um, with a certificate on it, or a set of certificates. It's got DHCP activated. Can you imagine that? Uh, a, a cell base station having DHCP on the back end. Just imagine if somebody really gets access to one single LAN socket, he might really be able to take down the whole network. Um, then the um, eNodeB has got a hardware ID. Depending on this hardware ID, the backend will publish some kind of configuration and the, the eNodeB will be quite quickly up and running. The only thing missing is GPS data. Um, if you've got a network, and I said so before, that different eNodeBs are able to communicate with, with each other, every eNodeB has to know where, it's, where it is. So either you connect some external device on the beautiful management interface, configure the positioning data, or you simply use internal GPS receivers. Why does the eNodeB have internal GPS receivers? Timing. GPS still is a one of the easiest ways to get actual time codes. And cell phone systems are time critical, so you need current times, you use GPS. Then you've got relay nodes. Um, somewhere in the beginning I actually said that a relay node would be a UE. In theory, it can really be. Now, the relay node itself is a selective repeater. So it will only repeat signal coming from one certain eNode B or from one certain cell. The problem then just is, how do you actually configure it somewhere out in the field? Um, you connect it using a SIM card. It goes to the back end, says, hey, I'm a relay node. Um, what am I supposed to do here? It then gets some configuration data, gets the data of this single eNode B that it's supposed to repeat, and it's going to work like that. So, in the same mobile phone network that your phone is in, there's configuration data configuring other cell phone or cell network aspects. Then you've got the wonderful self-optimization process. Now, optimization is very important, as everybody probably knows. So, um, self-optimization in wireless networks, what do you want to do? You want to avoid overlap. It doesn't make any sense to have some area covered twice or three times. So what you do, you let the single cells communicate with, uh, with each other. So um, two eNode Bs will be able to talk and to share the um, both time and frequency domains in between them and really re reduce the signal strength. Now, one quite funny aspect is, um, how does an eNode B see another one? Well, by asking um, some user equipment, hey, do you see any other networks? And the cell phone says, yeah, hey, there's another eNode B here. And go on, kind of faking a few messages and putting two eNode Bs a little bit closer together isn't really very, or shouldn't be very difficult. Then you've got the home eNode Bs, the stations that you've actually got in your house at home. Come on, you hack them. 
they're able to speak the same protocols as the proper Enode Bs. They're coming over a different security gateway, but you know how good gateways are. Maybe having your own home Enode B at home might enable you to take down a little LTE network. Okay. On this point, having some fun. Um, um, X2, for example, is the interface for um, connecting um, such devices to each other. Um, we uh, developed some scripts for spoofing and implementation testing for X2 AP to similar to S1 AP. So um, they will be also published on our blog uh, in the future. And uh, yeah, it's working um, with management um, uh, interfaces um, equivalent. Um, yeah, then we've got the simple question, um, yeah, as I said, the attack procedures. Faking the position of some E-Node B, trying to take down a whole network. Future research. Problem is, we've got theoret access to theoretical data, but actually try to find some cell, um, cell network operator that allows you to have a look in their network. It's quite hard to find. And then we've got the very simple question, LTE, will Darwin strike again? So overall, we will, would say um, it's a good concept, so there is a like thought, and there are good thoughts behind, but there is really a high complexity. And it's, uh, for all the engineers who developed UMTS and GSM, it's a really high, high complexity and a new technology. Now it's IP network, so um, we, are, uh, we all are asked to, to um, take a look at. Um, so, and we've seen there are some things uh, which are a bit shocking, like this self-optimization and self-organizing uh, organizing networks, um, all the auto-configuration features, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and the security m may be some bit more optimized, I would say. Um, but we also can see they have learned. So they go into the right direction. They see. Um, the transmission of important traffic must be encrypted. Um, they have uh, inserted tokens for better authentication and so on. Um, coming back to our, our message. Quite simply said, um, Darwin Award, there are stupid things that if they've been done once, they shouldn't be done again. Um, why do you need optional encryption on critical devices? Come on, you know if something is optional, there'll be a stupid guy not switching it on. And as I said, we haven't had access to real cell phone networks yet, hopefully. But um, you've got sex of corporate experience. Who really uses optional encryption? Why make it possible to switch it off? And self-optimization, organization, it's a very good idea, but there is probably really a little bit more work and research that has to be put into it. So for this point, Darwin won't win, LTE will survive, but I guess it might be able to change in future. Thank you. So, um, we'd be done at this point. Are there any questions that you've got to ask now? Otherwise, we'd be, uh, we'd be available after the talk. Perfect. Then, um, have a great evening, enjoy the party, and I think you've got to leave the room quite quickly because all the stuff has to be got out of here. Cheers. reminder to everyone here, uh, if you are taking photos, which you're more than welcome to do, make sure that you have the consent of everyone in the frame. That means everyone. So if I took a photo up here right now, I'd have to talk to each and every one of you beforehand and say, is it all right to take a photo? All right. Without, it, uh, without any further ado, this is LTE versus Darwin by Hendrik and Brian. So please. Okay. Thanks. Hello. And welcome to our talk. So my name is Hendrik and this is Brian. Um, we are both security researchers from Germany. 
Um, we are dealing with um, telecommunication networks, so for example, 4G LTE networks, and this is a talk about um, our um, current research. So we analyzed the 4G LTE network in backend and front and has been yeah, developed further on since. Simple things, stupid things, a nice guy who actually tried to have some fun with firecrackers in his butt and kind of blowing his balls off. Now the thing is you always hear these news and they could be fake. And most people think they're fake and most people actually say hope that they're fake. Problem actually then is um, quite often they aren't. And I don't know which one of you would actually try it. Uh, not really the best thing to do. So for us, quite simply, the question is, is Darwin, is natural selection the one enemy to take down long-term evolution? OK, back to the technology. Uh, we will start with some basics. Um, who of you knows the setup of, a, for example, who wants a deeper look inside? Um, we are involved in a in security, in a telco research project, um, which has ended last year, um, called Asmonia. Okay, so back to our talk. Um, why 4G LTA? Because it's a very interesting and new and very um, complex technology. It's a new one and it, it, it introduces a lot of very interesting features. For example, self-organizing networks. A security guy, if you hear self-organizing networks, so you're thinking about them, is it really working? So, we take a look at it, and we are talking about trust, especially, and optional controls mentioned in some specs. So, yeah, enjoy the talk. First of all, we thought um, each talk should have information, and second, uh, some kind of message, and because of this, we have a comparison with Darwin. Um, Brian will explain to you. Okay, yeah, so um, talking about evolution, I guess for most of you, Darwin might be a proper enemy for long-term evolution. Um, main aspect we're actually looking at, whether believing in Darwin or not, doesn't make a difference for us. Natural selection actually has a few, say, base structs, which we think are quite important. In this case, it is taking oneself out of the gene pool. Um, stupid things, especially in technology, shouldn't happen more than once. So, somebody's hacked, you've got the, um, the bug, the, whatever the vulnerability that was used, it should be fixed. So, second try, it shouldn't happen again. The Darwin Award itself actually originated from a use, um, use, Usenet group from around about 1980. And, and um, are searching for security problems. Um, this is, uh, yeah, should be the first talk of um, some more, and um, we will see um, how it gets. So, um, some background about us. Um, we are old school network geeks, um, dealing with a lot of technology. Um, we are working for the company called ENW in Germany, based in Heidelberg. And, um, yes, um, we make security assessments, and if you want to make security assessments in deep, you have to understand the technology in deep. So we'll take a look at each technology and then we look at um, security problems. Um, we are always talking about um, some topics, uh, security topics and on our blog, so it's um, shown here on the slide, um, for example, insinuators, so if you are interested in, talk with us, may, um, have a discussion with, uh, with us. Um, also on the conference or